Welcome to the Mill Surf Mike channel. Today I want to talk about the history of and show off my example of the Canadian Ross rifle. The Ross rifle, to put it mildly, was considered a failure, especially as an infantry rifle. Besides the cronyism and the Canadian nationalism that went into adopting and keeping it adopted as a Canadian rifle in World War I, a big problem was the rifle was created to be more of a marksman rifle instead of an infantry rifle. To put it in an automotive perspective, Here's a picture of two of my past vehicles about four years ago. Both had around 300 horsepower, but one was built for speed and the other was built for towing power. The Canadians using the Ross rifle in the trenches of World War I is the equivalent of picking the Monte Carlo, which ironically for this video is rated at 303 horsepower and built in Canada, over the Duramax to tow a 20,000 pound loaded trailer. Sir Charles Ross was an interesting man to say the least. He was a Scotsman who kind of lived the international playboy lifestyle. He joined and became an officer in the Second Boer War. By this time, he'd already designed his first rifle, borrowing heavily from the Austro-Hungarian Monlicker straight pull design. An avid marksman, his rifle was used by his machine gun battery as part of the Seaforth Highlanders. The rifle was perfect for wide open spaces and long distance shooting and fighting the Boers. It was here he met another hard-headed gentleman, Sir Samuel Hughes, a Canadian MP and close associate of Liberal Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who volunteered to lead a contingent of Canadian volunteers to fight the Boers. Hughes was already loud about his distaste for the British Army and his belief that the Canadian part-time citizen volunteers were better than Great Britain's professional soldiers. He fell in love with Ross's rifle and liked it even more due to Britain's rejection of it. Due to the politics surrounding Hughes and his militia going to South Africa and his agitation of the British during the war, the British refused to license SMLE production in Canada. Ross, who by this time was in Connecticut and producing rifles, offered to produce his rifle for the Canadian military in Canada. With the wheels greased by Hughes, the Laurier government awarded a contract in 1903 for 12,000 Mark I Ross rifles. The first thousand rifles were given to the Northwest Royal Mounted Police, who found so many defects, they went back to their Lee Metfords and Winchester 1894s. These problems were worked on and the MK2 or model 1905 Ross rifle came out and this is the model that I'm showing you today. Even though the British wanted standardization across the commonwealth of the Lee Enfield, the Canadians stuck with the Ross and an almost complete redesign was the Mark III or model 1910. Not much if anything was interchangeable between the Mark II or Mark III's. Again, Ross was an avid marksman and his rifle was designed with accuracy over long distance of mine over ruggedness. This was the official rifle as the Canadians entered World War I. Before getting to the war, we need to catch up with Ross's main sponsor, Hughes. A new Prime Minister, Sir Robert Laird Borden, was elected in 1911 and appointed Hughes Minister of Militia and Defense, mainly out of loyalty from the past support. Although many privately recommended to Borden that he sack Hughes, he stuck with him. Hughes would undermine the professional army by pushing for a compulsory Swiss-style militia, which was very unpopular with the people. He also ad acted to antagonize Catholics and the French Canadians. Borden still stuck with him in office. At the onset of World War I, Hughes went to London and said that the Canadians would remain an independent fighting force since they paid for everything to get the men and equipment over there. The Canadians were some of the best fighters of the war. They gained a tough reputation for not retreating while the French and Algiers soldiers did when the Germans unleashed chlorine gas and they held in spite of the poor performance of the Ross rifles. Many Canadians would dump their Rosses for, for Lee Enfields when they'd stumble across Lee Enfield from a British casualty. Sir British General Sir Edwin Alderson was commander of the Canadian force and recommended the switch to Lee Enfields. There were many complaints from the Canadians about the, about the Ross rifle, and he was refor refused to accept the complaints, telling Borden that the problems with the rifle were corrected and the Canadian officers were induced to make complaints. New Commander-in-Chief of the British Expeditionary Forces ordered the replacement of the Ross Rifles, yet Hughes still fought it. But the complaints were becoming too great for Parliament and the Canadian public to ignore. Borden was finally able to entice Hughes to resign by appointing him Minister of Overseas Forces, undercutting Hughes's power. The Ross did say in service as a sniper rifle, as it and the P-14 proved to be much more accurate than the Lee Enfield. The Ross was also used for training purposes in Great Britain and later the United States to free up Lee Enfield, Springfield 1903, and P-17 rifles for the war effort. 
After the war, Ross rifles found some limited use around the world and was popular in sports shooting due to its accuracy. Shooting my Ross rifle was frustrating, but a surprisingly accurate experience. Holy rimlock, Batman. I had all kinds of problems with rimlock with the rim 303 ammunition. But when I checked my target, I actually had some of the most accurate shooting with iron sights of all my mill serves. I'm seriously considering taking this piece of junk deer hunting in the fall. Granted, this rifle is over 110 years old, but if I had this much truffle, trouble with it, I can see why the Canadians with improvised urine-soaked masses, masks fighting the chlorine gas clouds would despise the thing. Please know where your elected representatives and the groups who claim to support you stand on the Second Amendment. You just might find the Republican you supported and the NRA are closer to Feinstein than they are you. Research and vote in the primary. Don't let the GOP select an establishment rhino or else you may just have two major party anti-gunners on the ballot in November. Please join the GOA, a no-compromise pro-Second Amendment organization who keeps you informed of what's going on. And most importantly, be involved in your state's organization who does most of the fighting that pertains to you. Please check out some of my other videos, comment, like, and subscribe. Also, check out my Facebook, Twitter, and who I support on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and as always, have a great day.